And this kit here is from the Italian company Italeri. Oh, um, Italeri. All right, all right, hang on. <clears throat> Italian's a bit rusty. Italeri. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all with the hand gestures. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale US M36B1 Jackson tank destroyer. The model in this video here is built for my own personal collection, it's not for sale and or purchase. However, as I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at EastCoastArmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box. However, I went ahead and made some extra modifications and upgrades to the model in order to bring it up to the condition that we have here. In this video, not only am I going to be going over all of those additions and modifications, but I'm also going to give this model a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a ton of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here would be the M36B1 Jackson Tank Destroyer, or specifically the 90mm gun mortar carriage M36B1. The M36 is a tank destroyer, and it's a dedicated tank destroyer. Basically, this vehicle had one goal and one goal only, and that was to go out and hunt down enemy tanks. If you look carefully at this vehicle's design, you can see how it's really optimized for this role. In comparison, when you take the Jackson or the M10 and compared to the other tanks that were being used at the time by the U.S. military, say the Sherman, the Stuart, or even the Pershing, you will see a vastly different idea and role for these two types of vehicles. The tank is more or less intended for infantry support, while the tank destroyer, its goal was to go out and hunt down enemy armor. With the way the U.S. Army designed their tank destroyers, it was utilizing two of the three of the holy trifecta of armor development, where there's more of an emphasis on firepower and mobility and less of an emphasis on armor protection. The idea was to mount a very high velocity anti-tank armament onto a fully revolving turret. However, have that mounted to a hull that had less armor on it compared to its tank counterpart in order to bump up mobility. The tank destroyer, utilize a fully revolving turret with an open top configuration. The idea of the open top was to save on weight, but also to give optimal visibility so that the crew can easily identify and find enemy targets in order to engage. The armor protection was admittedly lower compared to the tank because again, this was able to give the vehicle more mobility and speed, which was going to be paramount for its survival. The idea of the tank destroyers was really more or less to shoot and scoot. And if you have a vehicle that can be highly maneuverable, this would greatly help in this role. The story of the M36 really begins with its predecessor, the M10. The M10 was the tank destroyer that was the mainstay of the US Armor Tank Destroyer Corps and was designed and were fielded by the US military in the years that preceded it. The M10 basically encompassed all of those design philosophies that I just mentioned, and it had done this in two very unique ways. First was with the hull. The M10 utilized the powertrain of the M4A2 along with the lower hull components from said vehicle. However, unlike the M4A2, the hull was designed to be thinner armored, but it made up for this by having its armor arranged in a heavily sloped manner, much along the lines of the Panther or the T-34. In addition to the unique design of the hull, the turret was the open top turret, and it housed a three inch main gun. At the time this vehicle was developed, the 3 inch was deemed to be adequate with dealing with the German tank threats of the period. However, as the war progressed, German tanks became heavier, and when this happened, the viability and effectiveness of the 3 inch was becoming diminished. At the point of 1943 and into 1944, it was deemed that a replacement was going to be necessary. The replacement eventually became the M36. The difference was with the main armament. Rather than utilizing the 3 inch, the M36 was going to utilize the 90 millimeter. The 90 millimeter was going to be more than effective or thought to be more than effective at dealing with the German armor threats. 
to mount this new armament, a brand new turret was designed. The turret was vastly different compared to the turret design found on the M10. Another major difference between the two was going to be with the hull. The M36 was going to utilize the exact same hull as the M10, however the power plant was going to be different. By this point, the M10's M4A2 power plant was being phased out for the Ford GAA, and these vehicles were in production and were known as the M10A1s. So by the time the M10's A1 entered into production, it was deemed to swap them out and update them to M36 status by simply just removing the M10 turret, dropping on the M36 turret, and voila, you now have the M36. In addition to converting the M10A1s into the M36, all brand new vehicles that were coming off the production line with the angled hull were going to be equipped with the M36 turret from the get-go, thus having the total transition happen. However, as good of a plan as this was, as with most things, uh, they ran into some snags and supply problems. So much so that it was deemed to be an expedient change was to temporarily switch production from using those angled hulls from the M10 to just a standard M4A3 hull, which was in full production at this point. Fortunately, the turret of the Jackson and the turret of the Sherman are the exact same size ring, so the swapping out of the turrets was easily done. The only other modification that was needed was with some of the internal fittings where the ammo racks were replaced so that the internal magazines can store the new heavy ammunition for the 90mm. When these vehicles were adopted, they received the designation of the M36B1. The standard, or what would be the standard M36 with the M10 style hull, would be designated the M36B2. The M36B1 was more of a stopgap measure just until the rough patch was ironed out and then the proper M36s entered into production. The M36B1 and B2 both saw service with the U.S. Armor tank destroyer cores during World War II. One unique feature about the M36B1 was that it was the first U.S. tank destroyer and really the only U.S. tank destroyer to see service in World War II that had a bow MG. Of course, this was just a carryover from the M4A3 Sherman. Also, the M36B1 was heavily armored or considered to be heavily armored compared to the standard M36 because again, it was utilizing the Sherman's lower hull. Obviously, as these vehicles entered into the field, they came into the same shortcomings that were found on the M10, namely with that open top turret roof. Obviously, the open top gave great visibility. However, it also had some drawbacks. First, these vehicles were very vulnerable to air burst artillery, as well as also enemy infantry. A nice hand grenade lobbed into the inside is definitely one that can cause some problems. So shortly after these vehicles entered into the field, the crews and the maintenance battalions cobbled up some armored roofs to give the vehicles a little bit more protection. The armor was just made from boilerplate that was welded together with some hinges on it in order to give again some armor protection for the inhabitants on the inside. All of the open top vehicles had several different type of configurations of these armor roofs and they saw service during the war and even many of which saw service post-World War II specifically with the M36. After World War II, the M36 continued to see service with the U.S. military in Korea, and then also this vehicle saw service with several other countries in the post-war years, as the vehicle was still in service with a number of countries. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started, in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale, M36B1 Jackson kit from Italy. Or for the rest of the video, I'm just going to Americanize it by just calling it Italy. The Italy M36B1 Jackson isn't a new kit by any which means, although this particular one here is a new release, which we'll touch upon in a moment. But the kit itself is actually one that dates back to the late 1980s or the early 1990s. Although it doesn't really look like that to modernize, but at the time of this release, this was actually some pretty interesting and groundbreaking news because this particular example here was the very first time the M36B1 Jackson was produced in plastic in 135th scale. And in case modern model builders out there are scratching their heads on that one, well, you have to pause for a minute and let's rewind our clocks back to that period because 
in order to really understand why this kit was interesting, you have to understand the era that this kit was developed in. As I've stated in many of my 135th scale vintage tank build reviews, the 1980s and the 1990s wasn't really a great time to be an armor modeler. At this time, you still had a lot of kits that were originally developed during the 1970s time frame where they were first originally intended to be motorized. But by this point in time, being the 80s and the 90s, the motorization was stripped out of it, but you still had the old school tooling that was remaining which was kind of lame because at least with the other version, yeah, the tooling is a bit primitive, but hey, at least the thing could drive around on your table, you know, and you can have some fun with it. So at this time, you didn't have really anything new coming onto the scene. The only new products were just things that were being retooled by the other companies. And this was specifically true for companies like Tamiya. Dragon was a blip on the radar. They wouldn't really start coming out with new model kits yet at this point that would start happening in the years that we're going to follow but that's a topic for another video for another day enter Italeri. Italeri went through the 1970s and the 1980s time frame releasing a large number of interesting military vehicle kits one of which was their Castle M4A1 76mm Sherman. What's interesting about that kit is Italeri went ahead and developed a lower hull that was basically a universal Sherman lower hull. With this tooling, they're able to spin off many different variants of the Sherman based on that one platform, which was actually a really interesting concept, and it's one that's been recycled by other companies in the years that followed. The Tallery M4176 is a classic kit in its own right and was a really popular kit of the period because it not only gave you a very unique variant of the Sherman, which at the time no one else was making, but they also went ahead and gave it superior detailing, specifically comparing it to the other options on the market of the period, which realistically would have been the M4A3 from Tamiya. If you compare the Italeri Sherman to the to me, a Sherman, the Italeri Sherman was arguably a superior kit. For instance, you had features as a form-fitting suspension on the Italeri, as opposed to the static suspension on the, on the Tamiya, and the Italeri went ahead and went further with the level of detail with giving you brush guards that were individually molded that you would glue onto the periscopes. The Tamiya, these details were straight up missing. So they took that platform and they went ahead and developed this kit that we have here. This kit recycles the lower hull of the M4A1, but they went ahead and tooled up a brand new upper hull section, which was the M4A3. To make matters even more interesting, they went ahead and modeled it as the M36B1 which prior to this kit release here, like I stated before, was never done in 135th scale. Prior to the release of this kit, the only M36 on the market in 135 was the old school M36 from Tamiya. That one was an M36B2, which recycled the lower hull from the M10. Well, in what the Tamiya case would be the M10A1 because it's the GAA, but that's a topic for that video. Anyway, obviously it's very different compared to the M36B1 and because this one here was using new tooling of the period, it was light years ahead of the old school Tamiya one which dates back to like 1972 to 1974. These kits were released during this time and they were a general release item. However, it doesn't seem like that they were in production for that long of a period of time. I remember when I was getting into plastic modeling in the early to mid 1990s time frame, these kits were long out of production and I basically stumbled into this vehicle while looking through an old Verleiden modeling magazine. In his book he had a diorama with using this particular kit here and that's literally how I discovered what the M36B1 was, which is kind of funny because, like I've stated in another video of the same vehicle type, uh, this one always throws tank fans for a loop, even some normie Sherman fans. They see this and they have a spring bouncing out of their head like a fembot from Austin Powers. They 
they can't comprehend what this thing is, and I've heard some wacky hypotheses out there on some of the, the groups. In actuality, it's just a M36B1, but that's a topic for another day. Regardless, after seeing it in the, in the catalog, I really wanted to, you know, snatch one of these, and they were just not available at that time. Keep in mind, this was, you know, there's no internet during this era. Back then, you wanted a plastic model kit. Your options were either track one down at your local hobby shop, or shops, plural, because there were a bunch of them of the period and each one of them was an experience, or you would try to get one from one of the mainstream mail order catalogs, like Squadron, uh, Role Models was another one, and Phoenix, the model company, was, was another one I used to frequently shop at. Anyway, so, but none of them had this particular kit here. This thing just fell off the face of the earth and was basically a collector's item that you would see, you know, if you got lucky at a model show. Fast forward to about 1995, 1996 or so, Italeri took the tooling for this kit here, but rather than offering it with the M36 turret, they went ahead and tooled up a standard 75 millimeter turret, as well as the T34 cowl lobe system. That kit was released and was also one that was pretty popular and was one of those things that was advertised quite a bit at the time in the modeling magazines. After the Calope release, Italeri would again revisit this platform where they would modify it with the waiting ducts and they would offer that as a USMC variant of the M4 Sherman tank. That's also an interesting kit in its own right, but again, that's best for a topic for another period for another day. The next time Italeri released the M36B1 was in 1999 or 2000 or so, where they just basically did a straight up re-release. That kit I actually purchased and is a subject matter of an OTR video, which is probably gonna be posted somewhere either before or after this video here. Anyway, this kit then came out, disappeared, and it disappeared for a number of years, almost a decade or so. It wouldn't be until 2017 when Italeri would dust the molds off again and release the kit in this format, and this is the variant that we have here. One thing that's interesting about this particular rendition here is that it's different from the other previous re-release. The re-release from the late 90s into the 2000s, that one was just the old school tooling, just dusted off and went back into production. For this one here, they actually went ahead and made some changes to the kit, as well as threw in a few more accessories, which we'll be going over once I crack the box open. It's because of these changes, which was why I felt it was relevant for me to pick up and add to my collection, but another reason why I picked this kit up here was because of the OTR variant that I just mentioned. You see, on that build, I'm actually missing one or two pieces that come with this kit here, and rather than trying to reverse engineer them in CAD, it was easier just to buy another one, make a copy of the parts, and then I could cast the replacements in resin to get that model fleshed out. But I'm gonna be going over more of that information in the OTR video. As for this one here, once the parts are molded, I'm just gonna straight up build it and then, you know, get it placed in the collection. This particular example here, I picked up off of eBay, the other day, and this thing just came in today in the mail, so it's you know as fresh as it is in my collection anyhow. These models, although they were released in 2017, are still fairly prolific, and they're still you know affordable when found. I paid roughly about 35 some odd dollars for it. There's a price tag on here for 42, but you know that's basically the running rate for these things. Although these kits were re-released by Italeri back in 2017, and at the time of filming this video, we're a few years removed from that. Uh, they are still fairly easily tracked down. When I picked this one up here, again, I was on eBay, I saw a number of listings for this exact same kit for similar prices. So if you're interested in picking one up for your collection, at this point in time, they could still be done relatively easily. However, if this is really a kit to get into, well, this, well, we'll get to that once I crack the box open and I'll touch upon that again towards the end of the video. Well, starting with the box art and the graphic design for this particular release, because this is a current era kit, it has the current era of Italeri graphic design. This is similar to the Italeri 172nd scale M60A1 re-release that I built a little while ago. The first thing that stood out to me is with the exterior portion. Unlike the other box arts, which had a glossy texture to them, on their current generation kits, 
the box arts are satin or matte with the overall appearance. The graphic design is in this blue banner that we have right here running along the top with a yellow stripe and of course the Italy logo right there prominent on the upper right hand corner. The remainder of the information is still there. The name of the vehicle, kit number which is 6538, the scale, you have decals for an American vehicle, only an American vehicle because, you know, M36B1, and the other information letting you know parts contain one assembled model kit. The box art itself is a very nicely rendered illustration of the M36B1. I don't know who the artist is that a tallery has been using as of late, but the guy's work is pretty good. In fact, it literally prompted me to buy the, M the M60 build that, or the M60 kit that I mentioned before. The scene is pretty basic. It's just, you know, a muddy field, but the quality of the illustration on the, the vehicle itself is really nicely rendered. You can see the engine grills. The, he did the travel lock in the correct position. It has the rubber Chevron track, dish pattern row wheels. And this one here has the armored roof on it, which is something I'm going to be touching upon in a moment. The vehicle is taking fire. As you can see, some rounds are bouncing off, and the bow gun is responding back. Overall, I, again, it's not really a super in-depth scene, but I, again, it's one that I appreciate. Moving to the sides of the box, here we have a little abbreviated thumbnail, but unlike some of their other vehicles, this one's kind of cut because of the way the illustration was laid out. We have a nice little silhouette of the vehicle, tells you how big it is in centimeters, and again, all the other useful information. It's a mirror image on the opposite side. Oh, only on this side we actually have an actual scaled down thumbnail that has the whole composition. On this side, we have some corporate information, as well as a nice little color chart showing you how the markings are applied, or I should say where they get applied. Kit is for 14 plus, which I'm pretty sure I'm in that age range. I should definitely be able to tackle this build. And on this side here, we have just some brief history snippet of the vehicle in question. What's always interesting about Italian kits is because of all the markets they sell their kits in, there's a, you know, a repeat of all this in all the various languages, which I always thought was pretty cool. Also, right over here, we have a little thumbnail picture of a Fred of Photo Wedge, which leads me to the next thing I want to mention. This kit is not just an exclusive plastic model kit. It actually has some Photo Wedge to it, which is not something that you typically think about when you think kits from Italy. But that's something we're definitely going to go into more depth once I crack the box open. On the newer Italy kits, there's no cellophane on the outside, it's just these little stickers that hold the two box halves together. So you simply just open them up with a steak knife and then you can crack the box open. Hopefully, after all this, the model is in good shape and it's not deformed. That would be really anticlimactic. With the top off, the first thing we have here is a set of water slide decals. They are on blue printed paper, which is different from the older Italian kits I've built in the past, where generally the markings are on a white backed paper. These are, you know, freshly printed decals, so the quality on them is probably going to be pretty typical of what you see on the market. I will say that this version, the markings are a bit different compared to the older release that I built back in the 2000s, where that one had similar stars that are found on here, but the TO and E markings were very different. The next thing to talk about are the instructions, which seem to be quite typical for Italy. This model is going to have a few parts not used because of the way the runners are laid out, but basically what you see is what you get. The quality of the illustrations themselves or the, or the drawings appear to be the original ones from back in the day, but it's hard to, it's hard to tell for certain. Regardless, they, you know, they basically tell you everything you need to know, which is exactly what you want for a set of instructions, really. Of course, this one here does have the addition of the photo etch, but that's something we'll talk about in a moment. And you do have two or three different variants for the markings, which is also a nice touch. And it's one I'm going to definitely be needing when I finish the OTR one. Okay, so now we have the one new bit of equipment that wasn't found on the Legacy releases, and that is the PE. 
like I stated before, the PE was a new addition to this kit, and also I haven't really seen PE additions on any of the other Italeri kits in recent years. Obviously, when this kit was first released back in the day, the PE was not included, and it was just a basic bare-bones plastic model kit. So the addition of the PE is a nice touch, and it's actually, again, one of the reasons why I picked up this kit, just so I could have an old-school version, as well as their newer updated variant. The quality of the PE looks pretty good. Everything is clearly etched out. And judging by the way the tabs are, it should fold together fairly easily. But again, this is something I'm going to touch upon as the video goes on. So from the PE takes to the kit itself, and the entire kit contents are sealed in this plastic bag. So let's go ahead and free them so we can continue the review. Okay, straight off the bat, one difference on this kit compared to the older Italeri builds that I've done in the past is with the color of the plastic. On previous generation Italeri kits, they were always molded either in some sort of green coloring, and this is specifically true for armor kits. They were this dark forest green from the 80s, early 90s time frame, and then in the late 90s into the 2000s, it was more of a like a drab type green, and it appears now they just dumped that and went right for the dragon gray color. Which is also kind of funny because, as a side note, dragon would heavily rely on Italeri tooling on their first generation Sherman kits, and it was weird seeing them, you know, Italeri Sherman runners like this, but molded in this weird gray coloring. But apparently, you know, that's just normal now for Italeri kits. This runner here was the universal lower hull runner, where we have the lower hull, which it, current configuration for an M4A1, but they have adapters that, mod, that it change it so that it could fit a welded hull platform. Here we also have the semi-functional suspension with the rocking swing arms. We have the springs, the housings, as well as two patterns of sprocket. This has been the case with the Italian Sherman since day one. It's actually, again, one of the more interesting aspects about them, which made them more detailed compared to the Tamiya. In fact, I actually learned that the Sherman bogeys actually because of my first Italian Sherman that I built as a kid. But, you know, that's a story for another day. One change, though, that I see that Italian made to their mold is with the pattern of row wheels. You'll note that on this one here, the row wheels are the late pattern dish wheels. Originally, or I should say on the older tooling kits, even their M36 kit specifically, these were the open spoke road wheels. And the same was also true for the idlers. So this is a change that they made to the tooling, I guess, in recent years. As for the quality on the tooling, they actually look pretty good. You'll note that the Row wheels have their Zerk fittings integrally molded in. And the same is also true for their rear idlers. The sprockets are nicely molded. And again, it's always that decision which sprocket do you want to go with, the open spoke or the later pattern. And on this portion here, you see the remainder of the sprocket components. One change that they have made, and this is one that you know, since it was always bugging me on these Italeri Sherman kits, was with the center portion here of the sprockets. If you ever looked at an older Italian Italeri kit, on the center portion here, there's always a sinkhole that is present, and it's something that would always have to be remedied by the builder or ignored by several other builders. On the new tooling kit over here, you can see that they finally addressed that and they made it a nice flat surface. Although they forgot to add the little divot found on the inside, which oddly enough, the sinkhole kind of gave you, but yeah, that's something I'm going to be talking about later on in the video. On the lower panel, they, well, on closer in inspection, they improved it further. They gave you some riveting details on the escape hatch, as well as this other access panel here that doesn't exist. And uh, by the way, it's kind of erroneous that they did this because the escape patch has no riveting on it. It's just a smooth plate. And this little oval patch here was something that was added by a tallery in, I want to say, the mid-90s. Because originally on the first generation kits, it had their company logo and name over here. And then they patched it up in the, in the mid-90s. They moved that to the inside. And you just had this little access panel on the bottom of the tank. 
uh, now appears that they want to give you a little bit extra detailing, even though, again, the detailing is completely erroneous because, again, there are no, there are no rivets found on either of these pieces. So that's kind of funny that they did that. Um, eh, ooh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I see what they did. If you look at the side of the hull here, they actually gave you the sections for gluing on the HVSS suspension, and that's because uh, after the movie Fury came out, Italy quickly went ahead and released a Fury kit in 135th scale, and I could go on about that kit, you know, in another video, but that's why we have these here, so that kind of makes sense why they, they revised the molding. It's kind of funny because this is kind of what Dragon did to the Italy tooling in the 90s when they made their own M4A3E8 variant based on the same tooling, no less. So that's kind of weird how, you know, th things uh, go around. Well, obviously for this kit here, these aren't going to be kept and they got to be polished away, but Italy's always been doing stuff like that where they have tons of things, suggestion points molded into their models for stuff that you're not going to use and it's up to you to get rid of it. But anyway, that, that's something that did catch my eye. The next sprue here are the tracks, which I'll be revisiting in a second. Starting with the upper hull, this appears to be the exact same tooling as I remember it. So here we have the M4A3 welded hull with the grill work nicely rendered. The front sections do have their weld beads present, however there is no cast texturing found on these areas which is something that would be found on the real Sherman and also they're a bit, you can see on the flatter side while on the real Sherman they're, they tend to be bulbous. That's one area where the Tamiya one was a little bit better. But the remaining detailing on is, you know, more than adequate. Here we have the provisions for the front travel lock, but normally this would be fine. On this build here, it's not going to be needed, and these are going to have to be amputated because the travel lock gets fitted right here on the rear, which you can faintly see the suggestion points molded in. One change that they did make to this, which is again a positive one, is that finally Italy molded in the gas cover cap for the little Joe auxiliary generator. On all of the older kits that I've built from them in the past, this was always a bit of detailing that was missing, and on the OTR build I actually had to, you know, add that bit of detailing. And the same is true for the old school Dragon kits as well, by the way, because again, same runner. The remaining parts on the runner, you know, just I'm getting old school flashbacks on this one. Here we have the M1919, which is decently rendered, although you don't see it at all once you build the model. And you think it has this pivoting function, but actuality it really doesn't. The 1919 ball mount over here has this little extra bit of flash molded around it. It was always something that was a bit chunky to get rid of, but apparently they modified it where it actually plugs up the hole in the front pretty well this time. So it's going to be interesting to see how well that pans out. On the toe hitch mount, there was always a bit of flash on this in the past, and it looks like that's been remedied by and large. And if I'm just rambling over here, it's just because I built so many of these, and you know, just little subtle changes I'm noticing. Other than that, the remainder of the details are exact. Uh, oh, one thing that Italy did was that when they made this mold over here, they actually just swapped out the upper hull because this runner is used on the M4A1 hull and you can tell because you have a ton of M4A1 parts on here that are just not utilized for this Sherman or any other type of Shermans with this upper hull. So we have here the radial rear firewall. We have the air filtration boxes for the radial, the goose or the, the top mounted exhaust manifolds, as well as the M4A1 specific hull extenders. Another M4A1 specific part is the extra air blower because of course the M4A1 has it right there on the front. And when you build this kit here, you will have one as spare. One thing I always thought was cool on the Italy tooling is that they give you a pretty cool M1A1 Thompson. From the Thompson, takes to the tow hitch, which I always particularly like the way they rendered it. And here you can see the tail lights with their cat's eyes, the headlights, as well as their siren. Their siren has a bit of a quirk to it in that it is a nicely detailed siren, but it's a post-war rendition of the siren. 
There are also a few other post-war fittings on this tank that I'm going to be touching upon as the video goes on, but needless to say, when Italeri were studying an example of an M4A3, they were probably studying one that had several post-war upgrades added to it, and that would explain why it has the post-World War II siren. The siren that we have here would be more indicative of something that you would find on an M113 or a, a Patton, you know, something along those lines. But, you know, it's just one of those interesting quirks found on the Italeri tooling. So from this runner takes us to the runner that's specific for this particular example, which is the M36. And this is where you're going to start seeing some areas where the kit is going to show its age. This was something that was always one of the weaker points found on the Italeri kits was with the way the exhaust manifolds were rendered. The exhaust manifolds on the M4A3 stick out of the firewall and they gooseneck up along the lines that you see here. And Italeri did the cool thing by molding them hollow, which was interesting. Unfortunately, if you ever look at a real M4A3 Sherman, there's a distinctive piano-shaped duckbill section that sticks out on either end. And those are not present on any of the Italeri M4A3 kits. And again, it's one of the weaker aspects of it. This is one of those areas where the Tamiya kit is arguably superior to the Italeri rendition, but again, where these pieces are located, it's not that visible, so generally the kit ones work perfectly fine. The next quirk, it's not necessarily something that's inaccurate, but it's a quirk, is with the deflector grill. This one here is just like with all the Italeri M4A3s, where it gives you the post-World War II rendition of the flip grill. The flip grill on the World War II pattern Sherman tanks would fold inside of that cubby area underneath the engine deck, but on the, on the post-World War II example, they redesigned it to be a two-part design with this angular shape to it, and it would actually hinge outward. This is something that may not necessarily be accurate for an M36B1, but this may also be something that would be found on very, very late war production vehicles. So it's, you know, possibly plausible. But again, if you're a purist out there, perhaps this is, again, one of those things why you might not necessarily want to go with this option, the M36B1, and go with some of the newer tooling options. As for the detailing on the grill itself, it's actually pretty nicely detailed. You can see the fins are well rendered. They are molded solid, but you know, you could say the same thing about the Tamiya kits of the time as well. You can see that the hinges are decently rendered, and I always had good luck with these pieces during installation. They went together pretty well. Moving up takes to the kit supplied M2HB, and this being an Italeri American tank, you're going to be getting an Italeri M2HB. Italeri, just like Tamiya of the period, were recycling this bit of component and using it on just about every one of their allied and American vehicles. This kit here, I, I should say the M2 design itself, dates back to oof, the 1970s when Italeri released their M47 Patton, and they've just rinse, wash, repeated it ever since then. The tooling on it is, some people would argue, sim overly simplistic. I've used this piece on almost all of my Italeri models, and you know, it always worked all right for me. But admittedly, it is one of the softer aspects of the kit. Now there are aftermarket 50s out there that are 10 times better, you know, for sure, but it's again, one of those things if you deem it's worth it or not. Uh, I built a Italeri M113A1 a little while ago, and I kept the stock M2, and you know, it worked okay for that build. But again, it's something I can personally live with. You out there in YouTube land, you know, it's basically left up to your discretion. From the M2 takes us to the 50 cal travel lock, which was a nice bit of detailing that they gave on this model. It was absent on all their other kits, and even kits from Tamiya for that matter. The piece has the overall generic shape, but it's missing the little fork that's found on the inside, which is made out of a little thin piece of spring steel. But that probably would have been too hard to render in this scale with this technology of tooling. Moving up takes us to the ammo rack. Very, very simplified. The real ammo racks have little latches on each one of these shell areas to prevent the rounds from falling out. Those are obviously going to be missing on this kit here. And the ammo racks are, you know, basically good enough to, to give you the idea of what they are. And if you want to improve upon it further, by all means, knock yourself out. From here, you can see some of the other equipment, which would include the components for the 90 millimeter. And 
Again, very, very simplistic. We have some basic seats. The seats, to their credit, do have some nice texture rendered in for the leather in the, in the upholstery, but, you know, again, very, very simplistic indeed. Here we have the 90mm, which is a two-part assembly, quite typical for all of these models. This is the World War II pattern, which has the threaded thread protector on it, as opposed to the later variants, which had brakes as well as even port evacuators. But for this rendition of the M36, perfectly acceptable. Note the quality of the tooling on the part gives you the overall look and shape of the unit. It is absent some details. I will say straight off the bat, you're missing the crank wheels for the elevation as well as a myriad of other parts like travel locks and even yes, the breech. You are missing the breech on the Italeri 90. There's no breech components found from what I can remember. And uh, I had to scratch build on my last one. So that is something that I'm going to be revisiting again. Here you can see the mantlet, which is appropriately detailed. They got the geometry right on that. There's no cast section or anything on it. It's just a smooth plastic piece. Moving up, we have here the MP48 spring antenna base. What's cool on this kit here is that the antenna base is mounted on a bracket that's located in the front of the vehicle. And the antenna base they gave you is actually fairly decent. It's not too bad. It gives you the overall look and shape of the MP48. And after a few swipes of paint in the appropriate locations, it's gonna polish up pretty well. Moving up, we have here a spare barrel for the M2 HP. Although apparently Italeri didn't realize that the part with the holes found on the M2 doesn't come off with the barrel and that's actually attached to the receiver. But uh, yeah, I guess they didn't figure that out when, when they were designing this kit. Here we have the tarpaulin, which actually folds up and on the real vehicle would go and, and and deploy in this area over here, and then you could put a canvas cover on top to prevent the inside from getting soaked with water. When it's not in use, it folds up into this little location, it's strapped to the front portion of the turret. Here we have the very distinctive M36 wraparound handles, and it's gallery great. they did a good job with the geometry on them. Carry on brings us to the top portion of the turret, which, to Italeri's credit, they rendered it very nicely. It has the correct geometry to it on all of the angles, they went ahead and molded on the little footman loops, which are just littered all over the sides of these American open top TDs. You are missing a small little well bead here or there, but you know I'll be touching upon that as the build goes on. And we have integrally molded on the pinnel mount. On the interior section, pretty much plain. There are some suggestion points molded in for the various equipment pieces that get glued on, but you're gonna see what it looks like once it's fully built. It's pretty sparse on the inside. And this takes us to what's probably a deal breaker for a lot of fellows here on YouTube, and that's with the lower pan. The lower pan portion of the turret honestly surprised me when I first built this model all those years ago, because I wasn't expecting Italeri to render it in this format. And I will say that Italeri arguably phoned this kit in when they developed this kit here because of the way this is molded. You see, Italeri went ahead and they molded the interior detailing to the bottom portion here of the turret. And this is a technique that was done by Tamiya on their M36 back in the 70s. But Tamiya did it because, well, their tank was motorized and if you have batteries on the inside, you can't exactly have interior detailing. So by molding it into the bottom portion here of the turret, this gives you the best of both worlds. You get the interior detailing, specifically if the turret slips straight, and you can have your batteries concealed on the inside, and you can have your model running around. Why Italeri went with this route as opposed to doing full interior detailing is beyond me. I don't know if it was a corner cutting method or whatever, but in case anyone's wondering, Italeri years before this kit release here did the M32, which is the recovery version of the Sherman, and that kit has interior detailing. So, and it's based on the same you know, lower hull pan as this one, but for some reason for this one, they, they went with this setup. Uh, it does make the build 10 times easy, I will say that, but this again, it's something that a lot of, shall we say, elitist model builders out there are gonna turn their noses up at, but that is something that I wanted to mention about this build. Well, might as well go ahead and look at the quality of detailing on this molding over here, and you'll see that there are some nicely 
diamond plated panels on the bottom and to their credit that's exactly what the bottom portion of the m36 floorboards look like if you ever seen a real m10 or an m36 this is what the floorboards are going to look like if you look straight down there are several hinged panels made out of diamond plate they're on a platform and then the platform ends around here or so and then you have the the two driver seats right here with the transmission housed in the middle here you can see the floorboard of the m36 which is this panel right over here and this is where there would be some crew amenities and again you know they they actually rendered it pretty well if you're looking straight down the problem is you know a lot of people out there who build models uh, they tend to want something a little bit more prototypical compared to this abridged version shall we say outside of the interior we have here the storage pencil for the m2hb also a bit on the basic end and again it's not exactly one of the kids highest points but you know we'll see how that pans out as the build goes on the last thing i wanted to mention are the tracks and the tracks on the italian shermans were always something that were a hit and a miss simultaneously the quality of the detailing on the tracks were always really really good i always loved the quality of moldings found on the italian tracks and italian was cool because they gave the shermans out there two patterns of track. You had the steel chevron and you also had the rubber block track. In fact, one trick of the time that guys were doing was if they wanted to add some differentiation to their builds, they'd buy the Tamiya Sherman and swap out the tracks with the Italeri ones so they had those rubber block tracks on their build because, you know, back in the day, there were no aftermarket tracks out there. So the tracks were cool in that regard. Unfortunately, one ding that the tracks had was with the material. They were a bit on the stiff end. And on a tank with a static suspension, they went on pretty well. Unfortunately, the Italeri Shermans it kind of turned out to be a double-edged sword. Because of the way the Italeri kits have their semi-functional suspension, which on theory sounds awesome, when it was paired with those stiff tracks, you would have the tension of the track pull up on the front and rear suspension and you would get the rocking horse or what I always called the Italeri smile or bend and that was something that always stood out like a sore thumb. The other problem with the tracks is because of how stiff they were they had a habit and a tendency on breaking components namely the axles here on the sprockets as well as the axles here on the idlers and this was always because you're trying to you know stretch the track to put into place, the plastic parts are under, you know, some strain and they can and have snapped on a number of occasions. So that was always a contentious part of the track. The other thing about the Italeri pattern tracks was with the, again, with the sprockets. It's one of those double-edged swords, guys. You had these sprockets, which were very nicely detailed. They give you two options available and it's a multi-part assembly Piece, which means it will be very nicely detailed and rendered out. The problem is, specifically, not so much with this one. It can happen with this one too, but really, really prevalent with the early one. You have this small little surface area where you're applying glue, and you have to apply just the right amount of glue, or else it will be too thick and it'll destroy the part. The problem is, with the way the tracks were so stiff, and they're putting tension on the sprocket, the glue seams can buckle, and if they do, the sprocket just caves in on itself. And I've, I'm have i talking from personal experience here of that happening to me when I was younger. And also seen a few other builds where you could tell, ah, your sprocket's caved in. That was always a problem with the Italeri track, uh, which is why on the other OTR variant, I'm not using the Italeri tracks, so I'm swapping them out for mini arc workables. But that's a topic for another video. Back to this one over here. I can see that Italeri finally got the memo because they went ahead and molded these tracks with a much more flexible rubber. And this is a huge, huge win. And I was actually thinking about that, you know, the other week when I was buying the other tracks. I'm like, you know, Italeri tracks are awesome. Why don't they just change the rubber out? Like Monogram did it. On, on their 132 Patton and their Sherman, their old tracks were really, really stiff. And the new current release ones, they're awesome. They're nice and flexible and they're great. Um, you know, Italeri should do the same thing. Well, apparently they answered the mail because I couldn't do this on an old Italeri track or this. They were that stiff. It's just, 
this is th these tracks here I have a really good feeling about them and I think I'm going to be able to use them on these builds. But of course, we're going to there's only one way to find out and that's by building the damn thing. So, let's go ahead and get this one underway. And here's the model going through its production. One thing I want to point out at this point is right here we have the upper and lower hull mounted together. And this is an area I want to specifically mention because it doesn't matter on which Italeri Sherman pattern vehicle that you're working on, chances are really good if it's an Italeri Sherman you're going to run into this sort of a quirk that's found when you mount the upper and lowers together. The upper and lower hulls on these vehicles, they do go together, but when they do, you are going to have some seam work to contend with. Generally, it's going to be back here, where the hull extensions make contact with the rear hull. There's some seam work right here on the front portion, where the sponsons are, but the biggest is with the transmission cover right here. I have seen this time and time again on just about every one of these Italian Shermans I've built, and I've believe at this point I've built just about all of them with the exception of the Easy 8s that came out a little while ago. But they're using the same tooling so I'm pretty sure it's the same. Conversely, if you have one of the older Dragon M4A3 E8 Sherman kits from the 1990s, you're going to be running into the same type of situation because guess what? It's this tooling that we have right here. The way I've come to work with these models is that on some areas of the sponsons, you may need to do a little bit of hand fitting to remove a little bit of material so that the upper and lowers fit on a little bit easier. Even though, once that's accomplished, you will still have quite a substantial little gap found right here where the rivet strip makes contact with the front transmission cover. If this happens, it's a very simple thing to take care of and it's one that blends in very easily with a little bit of bodywork. On this one over here, I just filled the gap in with a little bit of super glue. However, I've had situations in the past where I've even used a little thin strip of styrene over here in order to just plug up the gap a little bit more substantially. With the way this one goes together, the styrene is not necessary and I could make do with just the use of adhesives. So, I'm going to wait for the super glue to set. Once in place, I'm gonna carefully take some masking tape, cover up the rivet strip, as well as the areas here of the front hull and the fenders, and then with the red putty right here, I'll be able to just smear it into the recess and blend it in with the cast texturing. And this is where it becomes somewhat easy to do because on the Shermans, they are known to have these cast front transmission covers, so blending in the seam work is actually a fairly easy technique to accomplish. On this one here, I'm going to be mentioning this in more depth at the you know latter half of the video when the model is done, but I went ahead and deleted the molded in supports that are for the front fenders. These I always scratch build out of thin pieces of metal on my build, so having them molded in place was not necessary. But if you are going to take care of the bodywork here, and for one reason or other you actually want to keep those things, you can, you just need to add a little bit more tape and take a little bit more care of where the putty goes when you're plugging this little gap here up. So as I mentioned earlier in the unboxing, one of the biggest shortcomings on this model is the overly simplistic details found on the turret interior as well as also on the turret exterior. So originally I was actually just going to build the model out of the box and just, you know, polish it up in that type of format. However, while I was working on the OTR version, I needed to make a copy of one of the shields for the 90mm and during the mold making process, I lost the part, hit the floor, disappeared, and I decided to then at that point, after I cooled down from being frustrated, to design some new components for this model in CAD. And since I was designing some new shields, I might also go ahead and design some other parts to remedy many of the shortcomings that were found on this older kit. So after I went ahead and designed everything in CAD, the components were released as a set and are listed on the ECA Shapeway store. The link to the listing can be found in the video description listed below. On the ECA Shapeway store, you'll see a large number of the other smaller scale detail components that I've tooled up over the years, namely in 148 and in 135th scale. These components here are offered in HD material, which means you get some very crisp detailing on them and are more than suffice for upgrading this older kit here. The sets are intended not just for the old school Italeri 
M36, but can also be used to enhance any other 135th scale M36 that's on the market. Such notable examples would also include the vintage Tamiya M36 Jackson kit, as that model suffers from many of the similar shortcomings as the Italeri one, so this set here would be a great addition to add if you're upgrading one of those older models as well. The sets are designed to have components for not just one M36, but for a number of them, so this gives you enough components for spare parts in case there's a mishap or two during the build, but also if you have a number of these older kits in your stash, you can upgrade all of them with one accessory set. In a moment, you're going to see what these components look like while fitted to the model, however, some of the most notable the pieces that were added are first and foremost the side shields for the 90mm. Obviously this is what led to the set being designed in the first place. The new components are far more advanced compared to the old school Italeri kit ones and are very detailed as I closely studied a real M36 for reference and I was able to translate all of those details over into the HD 3D printed counterparts. This would include things like fasteners, embossing stampings, counterweights, and other things along those lines, not to mention weld. In addition to that, there's also the breech block, which obviously is mega important because the Italeri kit is missing this bit of detailing. So the breech block is there, and this too has all of its appropriate detailing rendered as well. Some other components that are offered on the set would be replacement 50 cal pencil mounts, as the stock one is a bit overly simplistic and honestly has the wrong shape to it with the cone type appearance that's found on the kit one. The ECA one is basically the 1.6 scale one, but just shrunk down to 135. On a similar note, this is also true for the travel lock and the 50 cal storage equipment components as well. The storage pencil for the 50 cal is also included. Again, this is highly accurate compared to the original one that's molded in. As I touched upon before, it's overly simplistic with this kit. The last thing to mention is that I also went ahead and designed the proper dual barrel storage clamps for the 50 cal that are located on the rear bustle of the M36. The kit does supply you with this detailing, but again, they did have several mistakes that I touched upon before. But now with the ECA one, you really get to bring this model to its more appropriate representation. So here's the model going through the duration of its build. The hull at this point here is completed and ready for painting. All the revisions such as the cast texturing and other little doodads that I usually make to these models have already been added and I will be touching upon that as the video goes on. The big concern or I should say the big area of focus on this particular model is with of course the turret interior. Here you can see that the turret components have all been painted, weathered, and at this point here they're ready for final assembly. Of course, just like with all vehicles with an open fighting compartment area or full interior detailing, it's always best to go ahead and paint and weather everything prior to final assembly because obviously you're not going to be able to get access to these sections over here once everything is fully assembled. Starting with the upper turret half, you can see what it looks like with the interior fully painted and weathered. Of course, all sections on this are 100% stock. The only thing to mention is with this section that we have right here. You see, with the way the Italeri kit is designed, this little top plate is a separate piece that gets glued into this location, thus completing the look. One thing that you have to watch out for is it's best to install this prior to the interior being painted and because of the way it fits on. With the way this unit gets installed in place, you have the risk of potential glue marks found on the inside. And you also have some seam work to contend with, and both of these are best done prior to the piece heading off into paint. So the seam would run along this section right over here, right in front of the row of fasteners. And on the real unit, this would be one piece, as that's how the unit is made. It's one piece that gets fit in this area over here and secured to the turret via these fasteners. So the seam in this area here is not going to be use or it's not going to be required and it has to go. The seam work is easily polished down with a little bit of sandpaper and you just go up and down these surfaces over here until the scene is polished away. However, one thing to watch out for is with the other areas where we have these little fastener details around it, this can cause collateral damage if you're not careful with the seam removal process with some sandpaper. So keep that in mind. If you are careful with your sandpaper, you should be able to polish these areas down without any collateral damage.
The next thing to mention is the lower turret pan. This component here is 100% stock with absolutely nothing that has been changed to it at this point whatsoever. The way you see it is exactly how it looks once you take it off the sprue and paint it. If anyone has seen the OTR M36B1 build video, which should hopefully drop before this one does, you'll know exactly what I did to the interior to paint it in this format. Like I touched upon earlier in the video, the Italeri M36 is interesting because they went ahead and took a massive shortcut by molding in the interior on the lower portion here of the turret. And with the way the kit is designed is that you have the illusion of the interior detailing with the floorboards of the fighting compartment, which is right over here with the diamond plate, and you also have the turret floor right over here, which is rendered in this format. Like I touched upon in the OTR video, the best way to paint this is in this configuration here, where the floorboards themselves are painted in olive drab. And this is something that it's astonishingly strange to me that I still have to point this out at this day, day and time, is that so many people still do not understand how to paint the interiors of these American tanks. It's super easy. On the open top vehicles like the M10, the M36, the M18, they all follow the same format, and this is also true again even for the M8. The floorboards are olive drab. The remainder of the interior is flat white. The reason why floorboards are always olive drab on American tanks is because, well, we could do a quick little reenactment right over here with the turret assembled. If you're in an airplane and you're flying overhead, you're going to see that as opposed to a big, white, shiny object right here that says, I'm a tank, go ahead and drop a bomb on me. So it's for camouflage reasons. However, the remainder of the interior of the vehicle is flat white. And in order to replicate that on the Italeri kit here with a paintbrush, I just simply painted the walls of the cylinder section in flat white. This gives you the appearance and the illusion that the interior is white without having to obviously build the interior, which is exactly how Italeri intended it. So, of course, a lot of uh, modeling elitists are going to be cringing at that, but then again, they hate this kit, you know, in general, so their opinion means less than nothing to me uh, at this point. Uh, but it's always in, it always looks good when you build and paint the turret in this type of configuration. And this will more likely be more appreciated once everything is fully fleshed out. So with the turret sections out of the way, the next thing to focus on are the remainder of the little bits of equipment. So here we have the kit supplied fire extinguisher, as well as several of the seats that get secured into the turret. They are all just built and painted in this following format. Some of the pieces are just a single piece of plastic, others require a sub-assembly, like I believe this seat over here, where the backrest is actually a separate molding to the bottom pad, and the same thing is true for this seat as well. As for the paintwork, it's just flat black over the olive drab framework, and then they are just weathered accordingly. Fire extinguisher, it's a, again, pretty simple basic piece, and I just painted in the following format. The top portion's black, I painted the canister red on this one, and the remainder of the molded and strap details are just simply painted with the same olive drab that I painted the remainder of the interior details. Once this gets fit in place, it'll blend in without any problems. Here we have the mantlet. The mantlet is the kit original. There's nothing really much to talk about the geometry speaking. The Italeri kit actually has some really nice geometry on this piece here. It's one of the better aspects of the kit. The only thing that I did to perfect it further was to add the cast texturing, and this was done in my usual format that I've touched upon repeatedly in many of my other videos. Once the cast texture is applied, and once everything is primed and painted, you can really see how much the kit comes alive, as opposed to leaving it in with the flat surfaces. On the interior portion here, it was also painted and weathered with the same format as the remainder of the interior. Again, once everything is fitted in place, you're not going to get access to this section over here, but it's one of those things where even though you don't get access to it, you can still see it. So it's best to paint it in this point of the build. Then that takes us to the main 90 millimeter. The piece, of course, is a two half assembly, so seam work was contended with in order to flare everything in. And then the HD 3D printed components were fitted to the locations. The two guards here are the HD 3D printed ones. And you can see just how much more detailing and life they give the piece compared to the stock Italeri basic ones. And the breech, of course, is one of the biggest things was which was missing on the Italeri kit for one reason or another. And now that there's a 
properly detailed breech block in place, it really does flesh out quite nicely. So all these components are going to be fitted to their appropriate locations on the turret, and this leads us to one other thing which makes this kit interesting compared to the older releases of this exact same model, and that's with this fret that we have here. As I touched upon earlier, the older school kits did not come with this fret of photo wedge, and this is something that was included by Italeri when they re-released this tank, or this tank destroyer model, at this point in time. The photo wedge I actually or, you know, now that I'm holding it in hand for the first time, it's really nice gauge brass. Some lower end PE out there is very, very thin and frail, but this one here, it's actually got some nice thickness to it, which is actually a sign of good quality. The piece is going to bend together and secure on in that type of a manner. However, to secure it in place, I'm going to be using soldering as opposed to gluing, which is what many people out there use to assemble photo wedge components. Soldering, it's a much better format. It's more realistic. It's way stronger compared to glue. And in my opinion, it's just it's just conducive of quality to do that as opposed to using super glue. If you don't have the technique or the tools to do soldering for PE, then you might just want to roll with the super glue and call it a day. But if you have the capabilities and the tooling for it, yeah, you know, you might as well try, give it a shot. Some pieces are not going to be soldered and they're going to be glued on like the hinge work that we have here. These are just going to be dropped into their appropriate locations. So starting with the model suspension, the suspension components here on this model are all stock with the model. However, I went ahead and made some slight tweaks to them during the course of production. Starting with the housings themselves, these are, again, the kit ones, they go together quite well, but one thing to, that I always add on my Sherman builds is that with a pin vise, I add the four small little holes found on the face portions of all of the bogey housings. As I've touched upon in a number of these videos, on the Sherman tank, the bogies were designed so that you can use the same casting on either side of the vehicle, and this bracket here would simply just bolt in the opposite side for the reverse version. Well, because of that, when the bracket is not fitted in place, you still have the holes found in this area over here for mounting on that bracket, and this is something that would be present on all Shermans, and it's a simple addition to add to your model, as the stock one are missing these four small little holes. The next interesting quirk that I noticed with this build involves the row wheels. The row wheels are the kit ones, and they do look pretty good for the late pattern dish wheels. However, one quirk that they do have is that on either end of the molding, there's a slight bit amount of material, and because it's a slight bit amount of material, the installation becomes a bit tricky. If you try to assemble it out of the box, or at least from my experience, it's not really going to fit right, and it's going to put extra strain on the swing arms when it comes time for fitting them inside of the housing and things aren't just going to fit where they need to go. So much so that on this build here all the row wheels I actually carefully removed just a little bit amount of material by putting each of the wheels on my lathe. I was able to remove that little bit of material on either side and once that material was amputated the wheel went into place without any sort of extra problems. Once the wheel obviously goes on the remainder of the assembly of the swing arms and the housing themselves were a complete breeze. The amount of material that needs to be removed is very, very slight. However, it's enough to possibly throw off the alignment of the final assembly. Now, obviously for me, this was a very simple technique to do because I had the lathe, but most people tend not to have a machine lathe or access to one. If that's the case, this process may be a little bit more daunting compared to my experience. If you do not have the lathe on hand, you can still perform the exact same procedure by possibly using a needle file because you really want to be careful as you only want to remove the material found on the face over here and not harm any of the other sections of the wheel. You do not have any other wheels supplied with this build, so what you have is what you get, and unless you have a bunch of spare wheels on hand, this may be a problem that you can encounter. Fortunately, if you take your time, you go with slow speeds and have a steady hand, you should be able to remove the material okay. You should be able to commence with the remainder of the build. On the topic of modifying some components, you can see here that on the sprocket, I add the small little hole that's found in the center portion of the sprocket hub. This was done with a small Dremel bit and was done on the lathe. The lathe is the best way to do this technique because you have the absolute way to get the hole as centered as possible. As I just mentioned before, some people do not have a lathe, and if that's the case, you can still do the same procedure with a pin vise, but you have to be very careful when you're doing this procedure, as you can easily drill that small little divot off-center. As for the depth of the divot itself, it's actually really, really shallow. You don't want to go in all the way. Just a small little indentation is really all you need. 
Of course, it wouldn't be an ECA video unless I did the obligatory mention of the Zerk fittings. And the Sherman tank is known to have a ton of them found on the suspension, and the Italery kit here is no exception. And fortunately, Italery did an excellent job with the Zerk fittings that are found on the moldings. On this Sherman over here, there are Zerk fittings found on both sides of the main roll wheel, and you'll also see them right here on the return rollers themselves. In order to make these pop, all the builders got to do is with a small paintbrush with a little bit of red paint, you just add the paint to the appropriate locations, and once added, this really gives the suspension a very nice color pop that is something that really enhances the look of the build, as opposed to just forgetting them, as sadly most builders tend to do. Along those lines of painting things, here you can see the return rollers and you will note that they are painted in silver, as is the rear idler wheel. As I often mention in these videos, Sherman vehicles with the VVSS suspension had these components in steel. They were not rubber rimmed. And because of that, after the vehicle would be driven for a short distance, it would not be uncommon to see the paint chip off on these locations here, much along the lines as you see on my model here. Again, this is another thing a lot of people tend to screw up where they paint these sections to replicate rubber for some reason that escapes me. And that's always a sheer bet way to hurt the look of your build. You're not helping it, you're actually hurting it if you paint it with that color. If you just go over here with a few swipes of silver paint, it's the best way to render it and the build will look better as a whole. One final thing to mention about the suspension is that of course this is an Italery tank and because of that it does have the form fitting suspension as you can see right here. Because the track is nice and flexible, this does allow you the ability to have the suspension in the format that you see presently and you don't have to glue the suspension shut as you would have to do on some of the earlier examples of the Italery kits with that really stiff rubber track that were supplied with those kits. And that's a perfect point to take us to the track itself. The track on this kit is excellent. I really, really do love this track. It's absolutely perfect. You can use it out of the box and it will cause absolutely no problems. They paint very well, they weather well, they assemble well, and they get secured to the model just like a dream. I only wish Italian would utilize this rubber on many of the other kits in their lineup, and perhaps they are, I just haven't had the opportunity to really work on any real current renditions of Italian models. But if this is something that they've been adding on their kits at presently, that is a huge, huge plus, and it's something that is longfully, longfully been awaited. As you can see with the tracks fitted in place, they have the perfect track tension, and they are not in any way pulling on either the front or last bogey housing, giving it for that rocking horse type look that I've already touched upon several times. As for the tracks themselves, like I stated before, they paint very well, and to paint them, again, do not use spray paints or lacquer-based paints to paint single-piece vinyl tracks. Don't do it. Just don't even think about it. Uh-uh. If you're thinking about it, stop right now. Don't do that. If you do that, this potentially can cause problems with the track, and depending on the type of paints you use or the mix that you use, it can either cause the tracks to just melt on you after application, or even worse, the model be built in a number of years later, the tracks simply just disintegrate on you and dry rot. Neither of which is ideal, and then you're left holding the bag trying to find a set of replacements. Fortunately, there are a lot of good ones out there, but if the tracks are great, it's one less thing to worry about. So the paint that I use on these tracks here, just like I mentioned on all of these videos, is Tamiya acrylic. It's flat black. It was applied via the airbrush. And then once the Tamiya paint dries, the dry brushing is added, given for the distressed look that you see here. The Tamiya paint works absolutely the best for painting these single piece vinyl tracks. So far I have several of these models now really aging up there. They're getting close to like seven, eight years of age, which is funny, I've been doing YouTube for this long, but so far all those models tracks are absolutely perfect and they look just as good as the day I first finished the model. This is not just true for the Italian ones here, but it's true for the Tamiya tracks and specifically true for the DS styrene tracks because some people have had a lot of problems with them dry riding on them, specifically after the model's painted, and spoiler alert, that's because they're using lacquer based paints in order to paint their tracks. Don't do that. Use to me acrylics. Trust me, the tracks will never cause any problems by and large. So moving our way to the rear of the model takes us to the rear fender mount. The rear fender mounts on the model here are scratch built out of pieces of small plastruct 
angle that were cut to shape and then fitted to the model. Of course, I went ahead and drilled a small little holes for the mounting fasteners, which would be present on this piece. And again, like I always mentioned on these Sherman builds, the strap does not go all the way to the sidewall here and this is true for both sides. This is done on this side here because of the Little Joe auxiliary generator exhaust which is something I'll circle back on in a moment but even though there's no exhaust here on this side there's still that little gap that is present so this is something to keep in mind if you're building any sort of Sherman based vehicle. As for the Little Joe auxiliary generator this here is a piece of floor wire that I flattened into the shape of a small little oval and I just basically cut it to shape and installed it to the location that you see here. This bit of detailing is absent on the Italeri tooling and it's one that once added it's a nice little way to improve the accuracy as a whole. On a similar note for the side skirt or the fender mounts I should say this leads us to the side skirt rails which are found on the side of the vehicle. The Italeri kit does have this detailing integrally molded on but they rendered it much along the same ways as Tamiya and Dragon on the older kit specifically, where it doesn't have any sort of extra detailing on it. It's just a little strip that runs from front to back. On the real Sherman tank, the front and last sections actually have an angle to them, and these were carved into place with the use of a needle file. Once added, you can see how much it improves the look of the section as a whole. In addition to that, these strips here are actually in three pieces. There's a small one in the front, a small one in the rear, and towards the center span there's the longest version. The little cut lines were added with a X-Acto, and once added, again it's another way to improve the accuracy, but not as much as also the last trick, which is to add the small little perforations to the rail over here. This was done with a pin vise and a very small Dremel bit, and I just simply manually added the holes to the locations that you presently see. This is something that is probably the most risky technique because you can easily botch this if you're too fast or if you don't have your technique right or if you're using the wrong type of bit. And this is why for this I can't recommend a pin vise enough. A Dremel is definitely not a good idea because even at slower speeds it's going to be too fast, it's going to drill the hole too wide or you're going to get the plastic melting around it causing for some problems. For this you want to go with a pin vise, slow and steady wins the race and once done the rail will look absolutely perfect. Also on this section here, you get to see the addition of the weld bead that I added on both the front and rear plates. This is a common bit of detailing that is not really well rendered out on the Italeri kit, but the same is also true for the Tamiya one in all fairness. The weld bead here was sculpted with the red putty technique, and if anyone's curious exactly how I sculpt that, well, I actually go into this technique in far more depth in the OTR video that you can see in the video description below where I have a link to the exact location where I'm adding that weld bead detailing to both the front and rear section of that kit. Needless to say, once added in place, again, it's a nice way to polish up your welded hull Sherman, and it never disappoints. Back to the rear plate takes to the remainder of the accessories, and everything you see here is stock Italeri, from the track racks, to the folding rack, to the tool, taillights, brush guards, everything you see here is just kit supplied, and they went on without any sort of problems. On the taillight, as I always mention in these videos, the one here on the left-hand side, the top portion of the cat's eye is painted in red, the lower portion is always silver, and on the reverse side, the top portion of the cat's eye is painted in black, while the bottom portion is silver. It's another quick little thing to add to your builds and it's a nice way to make it pop as opposed to either not painting them or mispainting them. Either way, it's not really helping your build much in the long run. As for the track racks, well they are using the rubber version of the Sherman track link and so I simply just painted and weathered it accordingly. As I touched upon in the OTR video, I actually have a real Sherman track link of this pattern and you get to see the composition of it. Basically the steel sections would be inside or housed in the metal portions over here of the rack and the entire pad itself is thoroughly over molded with rubber so there's no metal that's exposed. If you're working on any sort of Sherman that has these track links, keep that in mind. A lot of people tend to forget that or they might mis ID something and make it metal when it really shouldn't be. The way you see on my model here is exactly what the tracks would look like with this pattern when fitted to the racks on the real vehicle. Moving our way to the front of the model takes it to the transmission cover and as I touched upon before this was completed with the added cast section ring. Also, as I mentioned before, there's a, usually a gap found in this section over here of the bolt strip where it makes contact with the transmission cover, and this was thoroughly blended over with the techniques that I touched upon before. Once the cast section ring gets added, everything is blended in and it looks absolutely seamless. In addition to the cast section ring, you can see I went ahead and scratch built the little footman loops that are found on this portion of the 
front casting. These are just made out of thin pieces of brass that were cut, bent to shape, and then secured to their appropriate locations. On a similar note, you can also see the fender supports, which again made out of the same type of thin aluminum that were cut, bent, and secured in place. Once added, it really does complete the look of this section as opposed to leaving them absent. And this is true for not just this pattern Sherman, but basically every single Sherman has some sort of a fender support found in place. Be it the single piece versions like this one over here, or even the early version with the three piece transmission cover, that one too has a similar setup with the front fender straps. Moving up takes to the remainder of the front hull accessories, including the siren and the brush guards. The siren, I admittedly did just reuse the, or use the kit supply one on the build. It goes on pretty well. Technically it is wrong, but Honestly, if I didn't mention it, I doubt that anyone else would even realize it. For the headlights, they are, again, the kit ones, and they are appropriately painted with both the main lens and the blackout light. Again, something that a lot of people tend to overlook. For the headlight brush guards themselves, you'll see that I add the small little canister found on either side here. This is done in my usual format. Fabricate out of a thin piece of shrink tubing. I shrink it to the appropriate shape snip it, and then mount it to the two appropriate locations. As I always mentioned, the little canisters are used to house a plunger, which is used to plug up the hole where the headlight is when the headlight's not fitted in place. Although the plunger may or may not be present, the little canister almost always certainly is. And this is something to factor in on your Sherman build. From there, also takes us to a very unique bit of detailing that's exclusively found on the M36B1, and that is with the front mounted antenna base. The antenna base is an MP48 and it's mounted on this little bracket that we have right over here and this version that you see here is the kit original. The kit original MP48 is rather simplistic but it does give you the overall look and feel of the MP48 as a whole. Also in this one you'll notice that I kept the stock plastic antenna. This is something that I generally don't do because the stock plastic antennas tend to break and or they have a habit of breaking and when they do they're unfixable. But for this one here, uh, you know, I guess I'll roll the dice. For the antenna base, it is painted with a darker shade of olive drab. This is a common technique that I recommend because it's a way to give the model a little bit more color pop as opposed to leaving it overpainted with the standard OD. Of course, you can still do that, but in my opinion, it's a nice, easy way to add just a little bit extra more color. In addition to adding more color, of course, this leads us to the insulator, which again, it's porcelain, a red type porcelain specifically, and most people tend to forget it on their builds for reasons that escape me. To paint the porcelain, to me a hull red, little brush of gloss lacquer once it's dry, and you're done and you're ready to go. Once it's painted, it always looks absolutely awesome. It's one of my favorite parts on American World War II vehicles, to be honest. Along those lines, you can see that I added the power cable right over here to the MP48, which again is another way to give just a little bit of more extra detailing. On the antenna, you'll see that I went ahead and painted in my usual configuration where the wire itself would be black, but the end connectors are painted with red on the top and blue on the bottom. On the real antenna, they would be knurled extension tips on either end, and this is done so you can connect several lengths of antenna wire to make the antenna itself taller. Even though there's only one of those segments found on this vehicle here, the knurled segments would still be present on the actual vehicle. And again, it's another way to add just a little bit of extra color pop to your build. The next thing takes us to the more interesting aspects of the build, and that's the side view mirror. And as I touched upon before, for the longest period of time, the Italeri M36 Jackson was the only one to give you this detailing. And again, it's a really cool detailing. I personally love adding them to my bigger Sherman tanks. But on 135, or for the longest time, the Italeri M36 B1 was the only one to do so. The piece gets painted and installed in place. I did paint it with a slightly darker shade of OD for the same reason as the MP48, and then was mounted in place. Sadly, I did have both of them mounted at one point, but somewhere in my pre-filming area, the piece must have popped off, and sadly, I haven't yet found it. It's in the room somewhere. It will turn up eventually. If slash when it does, I'll just simply glue it back in place. But fortunately, it's not one of those type of things where you have to have both at you know fitted at a certain time. So for the time being, the single mounted one here will do the job just fine. As for painting, like I said before, it's the dark shade of olive drab, and then I just painted the inside portion here with a little drop of silver paint to replicate the mirror that would be found on the inside. Also while in this area here, you get to see the little tow cable mount that's found there on the front. This is absent on the Italeri tooling, which is funny because it has the one in the rear, but it's missing the one on the front. The one on the front here was just made from a piece of floor wire. I bent it the shape and flattened it, and then once I had the item pressed out, I then just simply mounted to the location where you see it, giving that little bit of extra detailing, which is absent on the Italeri kit. 
Also on the front section over here, you get to see the hatch well area. The hatch well, like I touched upon before in the real Sherman, is a single cast unit that drops directly in place, and the Italeri kit is absent of any sort of cast texturing. Well, for this one over here, you can see that the cast texturing was added, improving the model compared to the stock original. Also, you can see the stock brush guards added in place along with the small little handles. If you take your time with the assembly, they do go on very, very well. And again, it's one of the highlights actually of the Italeri kit that they had these details that were kit supplied. Moving further back rearward takes to the filler caps as I always add on my Sherman pattern builds. I usually drill out little sections on these areas over here because there would be drainage holes found on the real vehicle in these locations. And as I typically do, I usually have the weathering of the fuel spillage which would undoubtedly drip out in these locations. And if anyone has ever topped off a fuel tank on some heavy equipment, uh, you know, a drip or two is something that is quite commonplace. Also on this section over here, you can see the fire extinguisher which is in a little box located right over here, and there are two little handles on the inside. As I always do on my Sherman pattern builds, these are painted in red, as again, this is true to form to the real vehicle. It's another one of those really quick, simple things to add to your model that gives a little bit more pop, and it's also one that sadly is commonly overlooked by most builders. Again, if you're watching this, just put a little drop of paint in those two areas, and your model will be improved tenfold by doing that. Also on the topic of the drainage holes, there's another one located right here dead center, found on the uh, what is on the real tank, the filler spout for the radiator, and that's why you do not see any real staining type effects added to the center filler cap found on this and other M4A3 pattern of vehicles. Carry on takes to the remainder of the rear engine deck section. This is all stock with the Italeri kit. These pieces are fairly decently rendered and they go on to their appropriate locations with really no work required. We have the travel lock found right over here, although I must stress if you are going to mount the travel lock in place, you might want to do so after you mount on the tools because trying to get the wrench and the sledgehammer into the appropriate location with the travel lock pre-fitted is something that's a little bit problematic. It can still be done, but it's a bit easier before this component gets fitted in place. As for the other thing to mention, again, because this is an Italeri pattern of vehicle, one thing that the Italeri kids do have are lots of little grab handles that are separately molded, and these need to be installed by the builder. The builder always needs to be careful with these components because they are tricky to deburr off of the sprue because of their nature. They tend to be a bit frail, and they also need to be carefully glued onto the appropriate locations, which, again, glue control and alignment with a pair of tweezers is going to be a skill set that is going to be paramount for this type of procedure. What I like to do is I like to glue all these components to their appropriate locations after I remove them off the sprue with a clean cut snip, but there's still a little bit of bird that is remaining. So what I do is once the super glue is set and the pieces are in place, I carefully, and I can't stress this enough, very lightly go over these sections here with some very fine sandpaper. After a couple passes or two, the burr or whatever amendments of the bird that are left are completely removed, leaving for the smooth appearance that you see on this model. If you do end up breaking one or two of these pieces, at that point there, you're really at the point of no return, and it's best then to just scrap all of the molded plastic ones and replace them with ones bent from small thin floor wire. Only if you're going to do that, you're going to have to start drilling into these sections over here with a pin vise. So this is something that can be done, and honestly, the metal handles tend to look better admittedly, but if you can use the stock ones, yeah, the stock ones will do the job just as well. And this now leads us to the turret. As I touched upon before, the turret was going to have some new detail components added to the rear section. Here's what they look like once fitted in place. Before I go ahead and get to those detail components, I just want to talk about some of the prep work that was done to the rear bustle area in order to prepare it for the addition of these components. So the first thing I want to mention is with the composition of the parts. On the real M36 Jackson, it's a mosaic of rolled steel plate and cast steel sections that are all welded together. The rolled steel sections are the side sections that we have right over here. The rear sections that are stamped and bent upward. However, the cast section is the large overhanging section in the back which is used to store the ammo. In addition for ammunition storage, the reason why this is cast is that this acts as a heavy counterweight which obviously is necessary because of the long 90mm. 
Fortunately, the shape of the Italo Retard is actually pretty good. It's nicely rendered overall. And in order to improve it, all I did was I added the cast texturing found in this section over here with the same techniques that I touched upon on the transmission cover and also on the mantlet. Once the cast texturing is added, you can really see how it improves this model compared to leaving it in its stock original configuration. In addition to that, you can see I also went ahead and sculpted on the well beads found in these sections over here. The well beads come down, and then have this iconic little bend found in this section right over here. On the real M36, the tart's basically a steel stamping that is just pressed and folded into shape, and then the welds are in these following locations to hold it where it is. This is actually also the technique that was taken from the M10 tank destroyer, but that's a topic for another video. Another thing to consider is that the weld beads are found in this area, as I just mentioned, and another reason why this is great to add, because this conceals the seam line that is present in this location from where the two halves are assembled. It's a nice way to kill two birds with one stone. You have the added detail of the wells, and you also remove the seam line, which would be present just during standard construction. The remainder of the well beads continue down from this section over here, where the bustle makes contact with the turret itself. And also, it's pretty tricky to get on camera in this light, but there is another well bead right over here, dead center, and this is where the two stamped sections are fused together and everything really just lines up accordingly. Once these welds are added in place, you can definitely see how much more improved the model is compared to just the standard original configuration that this model was in. So now I went ahead and went over all of those details. It's now time to go over the added details that were found on that 3D printed fret. So first we have here is the travel lock. As you can see, the travel lock is far superior compared to the original molded in one that was present on the Italeri piece. And we also have the M2's receiver clamp, which is right over there. The receiver clamp is one that is specifically custom made for the M36, and it has a very different geometry compared to the other US tanks of the period, including both the ones on the Sherman as well as the Pershing. However, what is the same is the clamp mechanism that we have right up here on top, which utilizes a Jeep style T hood type clamp, and you can see those details are present here on the ECA printing. Along with those two square holes that are found on the top, again, these would be present on the real one, and they are found on the ECA counterpart. Of course, like with all the mentioned items, the sculpted, or I should say the in, uh, it's a force of habit, the, the integrated well beads are all present, and this is just one less detail that the builder has to scratch build themselves, and the pieces are ready for installation out of the box, or I should say off the fret, so to speak. The next thing to mention are the M2 barrel clamps, which are found in this section over here. And again, one really cool feature found on the M36 family is that not only does it have the provisions for mounting on a spare M2 barrel, which is commonplace on US American tanks, but what's weird about the M36 is that it holds or has the provisions for mounting on two barrels, and they would be mounted side by side. We have here the little rabbit ears type barrel clamp. And then we have a corresponding barrel clamp, but what's cool about the M36 is that it has this really interesting plate that we have right over here. It's really distinctive, and it's the type of thing that's only present on the M36, and it's not exactly a carbon copy piece that you see on other USAFV, things like, you know, the headlights or the siren. Nope, this, this piece here is definitely specific to the M36. All of the mentioned components have the appropriate bracket detailing present, and also the bracket here does have its fastener and rivet detailing present as well, which is not gonna be easy to get on camera, but hopefully you can see on the bottom portion over here, those little bumps which are actually the fasteners or the rivets that secure the rabbit ears in place. Progressing further takes us to the M2's travel lock. It is in the stowed state. Again, this is the just one six scale one, shrunk down to 135. Although unlike the larger scale counterpart, that one is functional. Because it's 135, it is rendered in the collapse state that you see right here. However, the detailing on this one is far superior compared to the original component found on the Italeri tooling. And then we have the folding, or I should say the retracting, M2's pedestal base. The pintle mount right over here, again, it's the ECA 1.6 scale one, just shrunk down. It has all the fastener detailing, the lock lever detailing, the weld detailing, the fastener detailing, and the hinge detailing all present. The piece is far superior to the original one molded on, which as we touched on before, had this uh, like traffic cone <laughs> type shape to it. 
it was a, you know, a decent piece for what it was for the tooling of the air, but is definitely one of those components that didn't age very well. And with the replacement of this one here, it definitely improves the look of the model tenfold. On that note, you can see that the original Italeri 50 cal was not utilized. Instead, I replaced it with an M2HB mounted on an M23 cradle, and this is a 3D printed component found on Shapeways.com. This is one component that is not offered by myself, however, it is one that I cannot recommend enough. In my opinion, this is bar none the best option out there for a highly detailed M2HB on the M23 cradle. I've utilized this set and similar sets on several other builds found on this channel for good reason. These components are just exquisite. They're printed in HD material. The quality on the M2 and the M23 are top notch and they even have the ammo belt thoroughly rendered out with the links and with the separate projectiles and casings to boot. This is just as good as it's going to get for a 135th scale M2HB. The link to this item is listed in the video description below and again I cannot recommend this set enough. The sets come with I believe two or three M2HBs which is fantastic because you can never have enough of these things lying around. and. One thing about them, though, that I must stress is that they are a bit on the frail and fragile side, which is obviously coming with the territory because of just how detailed these units are overall. You have to be really careful when you're removing them off of the sprue, but if you take your time and you have the right tools and the patience and the technique down, it's definitely going to be worth the juice in the end because these units are just exquisite. For the paintwork, I utilize the same paintwork that I've touched upon on all of my Model MGs. Same type of weathering, and of course the grips, yes, are painted replicate red Bakelite because that's just how I roll on my models. Red Bakelite looks awesome and, you know, just add some extra color. For the, the belt itself, the links are painted in black, the projectiles are painted in copper, and the Shell casings are painted, well, in gold paint, but it's a type of gold that really looks uh, as a dead ringer of brass. All these mentioned details are painted via the paintbrush, and at least for the outcome that you see here. For the can itself, this is painted with a different shade of olive drab compared to the one I used on the cradle. This is again a common technique that I touch upon because it's a great way to add some differentiation and more color pop to your build as opposed to having everything one solid color, which if it is, it's just going to tend to blend in and you don't really have any eye being drawn to what's otherwise a very nicely detailed piece. To mount this M2 to the ECA cradle, this is going to take a little bit of hand fitting in order to get the piece to fit on, right? The ECA one is really close to having its, its body fit the stem that's integrally printed onto the M23 cradle over here. However, the hole needs to be enlarged just slightly and this can be done with a small router bit on a pin vise. You don't want to use a Dremel, just, you know, the pin vise, you just go in there very carefully. You remove just a little bit of material and presto, the piece will just drop directly into place. So from the 50 now takes us to the interior. Here you can see those added 3D printed components now that I touched upon before, only since the last scene I went ahead and added that little crossbar that goes across this section over here. This is fabricated out of a small piece of floor wire and it's not in supplied with the ECA sets, but this is something that can easily be fabricated by the builder. When you're adding this detail, and keep in mind there is a small little dog leg bend right there on this section over here, and it's something that can easily be whipped up in a matter of minutes. Once added in place, it completes the look of the breach area as you can see here. And also on that note, you can see that with this one having the roof installed, it really does mitigate quite a bit, a lot of the shortcomings that I originally found with the model, with the turd off, with the simplistic interior detailing that I already touched upon earlier. With the roof in place, you really get a good idea or a good opportunity to view the breach area. And since the breach area has been upgraded with the ECA parts, it really does make it look a lot more enhanced compared to the way it was originally supplied with the kit. When you are securing the roof on in place though, you are not going to be utilizing the tarplin tripod, which is normally fitted on the front section over there of the model. And it's just one of those things where if you're going to go with this route, you just omit that small little detailing. As for the piece itself, this is all soldered together as I touched upon before. And the soldering goes by really, really easily. Specifically, you have a good soldering iron and the very thin electrical solder, which is what I tend to use on all of my modeling subjects. 
some flux is definitely good to go. If you're curious on exactly how to solder stuff like this, on a few of my videos, I actually have some soldering tutorials, but they're <laughs> mostly used on the 1-6 scale Armatech builds. However, the techniques are still the same, even though the pieces are much bigger and thicker in comparison to the ones that we have here. Aside from just soldering the pieces together, the soldering is just used just to get the basic structure and shape. That's done where you want to have the optimum amount of strength required. For the remaining details like the little grab handles and the hinge work, those are simply applied on with super glue. Once those are in place, this is the final outcome that you will get. The piece then just drops into the appropriate location that you see here, and once it's all set, you're obviously good to go. Carrying on further, takes to the grab handles found on the side. These are the kit originals, and they are very nicely rendered. The pieces have the correct shape to them. The installation is a little tricky just due to the curvature found on the turret, so this is something that you want to put a small little drop of glue on each end, wait for that to set, and then with maybe some really thin super glue, just add some to the center spindles over here, and once they are set, you're good to go. Carry on further, takes to the trunnion. Of course, we do have these little knobs found each side. These are separately molded and have to be glued on. When you're gluing them on, you want to make sure they are centered and they are in the right location. Other than that, they go on pretty much easy and effortlessly. On the front section, there was another little modification that I made, and that's with this little gutter that we have right here. The model has, I believe, a little blister found in this section. In order to enhance the model further, the blister was amputated, and in its place, I took a small little piece of Plastruct channel, and I just simply cut and mounted it to the appropriate location. On the real one, I believe that this gutter here is used to snap on the tarpaulin, and it's the grab point for it to hook up on the front. From there, it takes to the mantlet. We already touched upon the added detailing earlier, and as you can see, it looks fantastic in its final form. Definitely looks the part, and it's definitely, a, again, a quick way to add some extra detail kick to your model. Finally, we get to the 90mm again, two-piece assembly. I already touched upon the bodywork required earlier to flare everything in, and again, in its final form, this is the final outcome that you get. Overall, I really do like the geometry found on this section over here, and in my opinion, the Italeri kit has a decent rendered 90mm, so much so that the need to replace it with an aftermarket one really isn't that necessary, specifically if you're not rendering it with the muzzle brake. If you are going to go with that route, well, you know, that changes things quite a bit. But if you're just going to keep the stock one with the threat protector in place, honestly, the kit one can be used without any issues. And this takes us to the paint and the markings. And for this one here, I went with a dual tone late ETO camouflage pattern. Since my other M36 is just an all olive drab, I decided to mix this one up by painting it with this type of camouflage pattern, which is more than appropriate, specifically for not just this pattern vehicle, but even this particular version with the armored roof. The camouflage pattern was applied in my usual manner. First, the base coat is my typical late World War II, or not even late, it's just my typical World War II shade of olive drab. I've utilized and touched upon this color in many of my vehicle builds. And the black ribbons that you see are airbrushed on, which is to me a flat black. The remainder of the weathering is done in my usual format with the use of washes, filters, and dry brushing. The former is all done via the airbrush, and then the dry brushing is all done, well, with a paintbrush, obviously, giving you for the end result that you see here. And then from there, this brings us to the markings themselves. And the markings are the kit supplied water slide decals, and the quality on them was actually really good, which is, again, something that is good and noteworthy to point out, because as I touched on before, I've had other Italian builds come across this channel where the markings were really not the strong suit of the build. For this one here, that wasn't the case, thankfully. Uh, one great thing about the decals is that there was enough for three vehicles, and if I or and if because of the uh, the amount of decals that were supplied, I was able to not just mark this model, but the remainder I was able to apply to the other M36 that I was able to restore. The one marking, however, that I don't recommend anyone utilize on their build is the one that would go right over here on the engine deck. There is the one marking configuration to render a certain M36, and it did have a large star painted right here on the engine deck. The reason why that decal is not really a good idea or is recommended is because whenever you have a decal found on a grillwork section like this, it's very problematic because, well, frankly, you 
have all these grill slats over here and they are just not the type of thing that decal very well. It'll kind of stick out like a sore thumb where you have grills and then wherever the decal is, it's all, you know, solid and it makes things harder to, to prep. It makes things harder to varnish. It's just not the best medium for this type of application. If anyone is working on any 135th scale model and they run into a, a type of marking similar to this, what I recommend is honestly to go with a stencil. Cut out a little star stencil, apply some mask, paint it on, and then peel it off and the model will look way better with the marking applied in that format as opposed to trying to shoehorn a decal in this setup. Decals are best for flat plates or even just curved surfaces, but for perforated things like this here, they are not the medium to go with that. So that is the one warning I do want to stress for the markings. Outside of that, the markings, again, went on absolutely effortlessly, and then everything was sealed with the VMS matte varnish. Again, I always recommend this product for reasons that should be fairly obvious. It's a great product, it goes on very easily, and it just makes the models look all that much more polished, and it does a fantastic job with securing and making the decals nice and flat, or as flat as possible, to the side of the vehicle. Again, can't recommend this product enough. One other thing that I was just reminded of that I negated to mention earlier is if anyone is working on this kit here and you're using the kit antenna just like I did on this one, this makes the rotating of the turret a bit more problematic because if you're going to rotate in this direction, it's perfectly fine. But if you want to render the turret in this way, you're going to see what's going to happen very quickly. If you hit a certain point, you're going to make contact with the antenna wire, and if you keep going and you forget, it's just going to snap right off. And obviously, if that happens, you're going to have to, it, you're, you're, let's just say your life's going to be a little bit more complicated. So if you are going to render this model with the turret facing the other way, I recommend rotating the turret to a certain point where the turret is removed, just flipping it over like I just did, and then adjusting the turret accordingly until you get the appropriate shape. Of course, as I routinely mention in these videos where I build a model as a companion to an OTR, at the end, I might as well go ahead and have the OTR make a nice quick cameo in the video over here. This model, of course, is the old 1990s, or I should say the 2000 vintage release of the Italeri M36B1 kit. This one here was recently restored, and there is an entire video of this model's restoration found on the ECA channel. And here you get to see the two side by side. And many of the detail components that I touched upon that were added to this one were also added to this one here. This would include things like the East Coast Armory 3D printed components, but also the other things like the aftermarket M2 HB 50 cals. Other enhancements, such as the cast texturing, were added to the exact same locations, both on the hull as well as on the turret. And also it's because of this build over here, which is why I was able to have enough markings on hand to fully equip the model that you see right here presently. And it's always nice to have two examples of a certain type of vehicle because you get to render them in slightly different configurations. This one here with the armored roof, this one here without the armored roof, and also this applies to the camouflage pattern, and even for this one here, the pattern of tracks. As I mentioned before, the stock ones were not utilized, and this one is fully equipped with a set of workable track links from Miniart. But again, all of that information is thoroughly discussed in the OTR video for this particular build that we have here. If anyone's curious about this one, it can be found in the video description listed below. At the end of the day, this build actually turned out much better than I originally anticipated. As I mentioned earlier, when I first took this project on, I was anticipating this build to be just a standard built out of the box build with a few slight little hand tweaks that I generally make to my Sherman builds added here or there. However, because of that happy accident, me losing that component, I was able to take this model and really take it past what the original kit offered by improving several of the shortcomings that were found on the original tooling. And because of that small little snafu, not only was I able to do this modification and improve one of these Italeri M36B1s, but as I mentioned before, I got two of them that have been spiced up and are now in my collection. And this is a perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendation, and this is where this model actually becomes fairly interesting. Much along the lines of several other vintage tank kit builds that I reviewed and recommended in the past, this one here is going to follow a similar format. So with that, going back to skill levels, if someone is a beginner model builder in that they've never touched a kit before in their life, or maybe they built one or two simple 
builds in the past, this is not going to be the kit for you. The Italeri Shermans as a whole are not really beginner friendly in my opinion. They have the added complexity with the form fitting suspension along with several of the other small finely molded detail bits. Things like the brush guards for the periscope, the small little grab handles, and even just the headlight brush guards in general tend to be on the frail side and if someone doesn't have experience with working with some of these smaller assemblies they can lead to problems quite quickly. The other thing about the Italeri kit that aren't really beginner friendly are with the way the parts fit together. These old Italeri kits do require a small bit of hand fitting here or there in order to get the parts to fit, namely the upper and lower hull sections. And this is something that a beginner is going to have some difficulty with. Not to mention other components like the Bow 1919. This is something that always requires a bit more of fiddling around with in order to get the parts to fit where they need to go. Again, because of this, I cannot recommend this kit to an you know, off the street, so to speak, type beginner. So more or less, this is gonna be one of those models that are geared for an intermediate to an advanced range builder. An advanced range person is probably going to feel a bit underwhelmed with this kit over here and are generally going to look for something that's a bit more challenging and for the next level. So although a advanced builder can obviously tackle one of these kits, it's not really necessarily up to their challenge level. But this, would really cement this build into someone who is an intermediate builder. By this point, you should have the skill sets in order to assemble all those components that I mentioned earlier, and you should be able to do so with some regularity and also with some comfort. Because this is a Sherman-based vehicle, there are lots of aftermarket accessories out there in order to take this model past what the original kit gives you and to really polish it up into something that's quite unique. There are a plethora of components from plastic injection molded parts to resin cast, metal, turned metal, 3D printed, photo etch, you name it, there are 801 different components out there in order to spruce one of these up. Briefly, as I mentioned before, on the OTR version, I swapped out the tracks with workable link. And also on this particular example, I went ahead and added those new 3D printed components that I touched upon earlier. So, of course, just like with the real vehicle, there is a bit of adaptability to this kit that we have here. However, even though all these options are out there and available on the marketplace, this is going to tie into what I'm going to touch upon now, which is recommendations. Because although this kit can be upgraded with all those really excellent components, is it actually worth it in the end? And this, again, is really going to be left up to the builder's discretion and who exactly would I even recommend this build for? Well, if you're the type of person who's a Rivet County perfectionist and if you're the type of person who's looking for a super scale accurate rendition of the M36B1 where this thing is as good as it possibly can be, then most certainly, absolutely, without a doubt, this is not going to be the kit for you, okay? Uh, do not walk, run from this kit if you're one of those type of individuals and are looking for that type of an experience. This kit here is really more or less meant for someone who is interested in dabbling with the American open top World War II tank destroyers, but aren't really looking to have something that is that complex of a build to do. So for instance, if you're like a person that loves those online tank games and you really dig this vehicle, but the idea of the full interior with the engine compartment, all that stuff really doesn't appeal to you, well then the Italeri version of the M36 is a fantastic choice for you. On a similar note, if you are just, you know, evolving in your builds and you've already built a number of Shermans in the past from Tamiya or some of the other easier model maker companies and you're looking for something that's a little bit more complicated but it's still relatively easy to do then this kit here is also going to be recommended. On a similar note again if you're interested in the US tank destroyers but you know you're still not comfortable yet with working on tanks with full interior details because that is its own skill set in its own right again this kit here would be the perfect addition to have to your collection. You have to put your toe into the water, so to speak, get the idea and feel of one of these open top American tank destroyers, but doing so without having to fully commit with some of the other kits that are on the market that are a bit more complicated and may require some more skill sets that you don't really have ironed out yet.
And if you're watching this and are saying to yourself, okay, John, but what are some of these really advanced kits on the market that you're referring to? Well, for an M36B1, basically your go-to is going to be Academy. The Academy M36B1 kit is a fantastic choice and it basically has what you're looking for. It is a more modern tooling kit, so it's got a lot of the more modern molding technologies that are built into it. It has the form-fitting suspension just like this one over here, but the interior is much more well thought out and fleshed out compared compared to the older Italian kit that we have here on the table. I will also say that this particular version of the Italian release, the one from 2018 specifically, is probably also one of the better releases of this particular kit that are out there on the marketplace. Because Italian went ahead and addressed some of the shortcomings that were found on their Sherman based kits, things like the gas cap cover, but more specifically with the more flexible track, this does make the model a bit easier to put together and you don't have to deal with the the bend that I was referring to with the suspension. As this one here, you can use the kit tracks and as you can see, it does perform quite well for this task. The other thing that I enjoy about this rendition is with the addition of the photo etch roof. This was a smart idea on Italeri's behalf because with just the addition of this one extra part, this sort of in a way conceals the shortcomings of the limited interior that I also touched upon before. So if this is something that is more to someone's liking, perhaps this would be the choice to go. Admittedly though, the addition of the PE does make the model a little bit more complex compared to the version without, but again, if you're the intermediate type builder, perhaps this is going to be some nice entry level photo watch in order to get into. The photo watch does bend very well. It secures in place. However, of course I use solder on this one here, but again, it's a great way to try out and test some techniques on something that's relatively easy and is more or less forgiving compared to some other photo watch sets that are out there on the market. So in addition to all of that, I would definitely also recommend this kit for anyone who's just basically a fan of World War II American tank destroyers. If you're a fan of the M10, the Jackson, the Hellcat, the Super Hellcat, all of those mentioned vehicles, the M36 Jackson here is basically going to be a shoe-in. And this particular version here with the B1 platform is definitely a very interesting and unique variant on the M36. And it's always one that I mentioned before that seems to throw people off whenever they see or encounter one of these vehicles on the internet or possibly even if they encounter one that's preserved in person. And obviously, if you're going to be into the World War II tank destroyers, you're going to be into just World War II tanks or just American tanks or American World War II tanks as a whole. And again, if that's you, the addition of the M36B1 here is a nice addition to add to your collection as well. And yes, as a side tangent here, if you're a Shermanaholic, obviously the Jackson is in that family and it would behoove you to add this to your collection as well. Uh, another person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's just a completist type collector, basically like myself, who you're into collecting a example of each of the releases from all the different companies. The Italeri one here would definitely be a recommendation for that. And on that note, if you are collecting this one, you might also want to get one of the earlier versions without the metal roof on it, just again to scratch that completist type mindset. Uh, and on a similar note, because this is a vintage vehicle, or I should say a vintage kit, if you're also a collector of vintage model kits, the Italeri M36B1 here is another one that should be added to your collection as well. Another person who I would not necessarily recommend this kit to would be anyone who's into building dioramas. Normally, a vehicle like this would be pretty good subject matter for a diorama use because of the open nature of the turret. This allows the builder to come up with some interesting usage for that feature. However, because the turret interior on this is fairly basic and it's not really well fleshed out, this is something that might not necessarily be a good candidate for that. And honestly, if you're looking for a candidate for a diorama and it's going to be a Jackson, you might want to go with some of the other options on the market that do have the full interior fleshed out. So basically, swinging back to what I said before, this kit is more or less recommended for anyone who's a casual builder and you're looking to have an M36B1 Jackson in your collection, but you're not a super hardcore fan of the vehicle. Well, this kit here is a good idea for you. It's simple, or I should say it's relatively simple to build. It looks pretty good by the most part once it's completed and you don't really have the added complexity of some of the other kits around the market, namely the ones with the full interior detailing.
And since these kits are fairly prolific and when found can be had for some relatively good prices, perhaps this is something to look into if you're just trying to scratch that M36 itch. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M36 B1 Jackson Tank Destroyer. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.